In the video on the equivalence principle, we looked at two situations that we said were identical to each other. First one being, let's say I have a spaceship out in deep space, so far away from any other you know, planets or stars or anything that could cause a gravitational effect. And I, here I am floating around in my, in my little box spaceship, and I set up a laser to simply just fire a beam of light across my spaceship. And very clearly, there's no gravitational effect, so, so we say that this is the natural motion of the light. It goes between two points and takes the, the shortest distance there. Then we looked at, well, what if I have a planet or something, and I take my same experiment, my same uh, spaceship, and just drop it. So inside of that, I still feel like I'm in free fall if I'm, uh, if I'm falling at the same rate of this box. So if I do my experiment firing the laser across, uh, firing this beam of light across my ship, it should have the same result and, and go to the end mirror. But to the perspective of someone on the outside of this ship, as the beam of light propagates across, this ship is going to have it have fallen a certain distance. So now my receiver is over here. So this beam of light, from the perspective of a person in the gravitational at rest in the gravitational field, will seem like it's curving downwards. So the natural motion of light in a gravitational field seems to be seems to be able to curve. And this is what we looked at in the in the equivalence principle. We also looked at how different kinds of geometries, uh, curved geometries uh, work. And what I want to do now is just take a little look at how those ideas might match up. Well, let's say I do another experiment where out in deep space, uh, far away from any masses or anything, I take three lasers and I'm just going to take my beam of light and fire them between these lasers and it'll form a triangle. And I notice that I can measure the angle between the light that I that is sent to me and the light that I emit. And I notice that if I'm far away from any anything else, I'm in flat space. Or more more accurately, space time is is flat. Uh, and in this case, all of these angles are going to equal 180 degrees, which matches up with how we kind of talked about flat space should work in the in the geometry video. But let's say I take that same setup, same setup, and instead of just having having nothing there, let's say I put a, a planet or a, or a star or something here, some mass there. Well, then according to the equivalence principle that we were looking at, the light should bend as it passes by that planet. So maybe the light goes on on this trajectory and it'll be a very slight bend. It won't be very much unless you have, unless you're doing this right beside a black hole or something like that. But we just get a little bend. And then if we measure these angles, we're gonna notice that the angle that, the sum of the angles that we get is going to be greater than 180 degrees. And this implies that our space time is now curved. So we see that with this framework, there's a relationship between whether I put a mass in here and the curvature of space time. So, so how does this work in the perspective of, of general relativity? Well, general relativity makes uh, makes two assumptions in this regard. The first one is that light and and uh, small particles follow geodesics. So and by small particles, I mean particles that have a small mass compared to the the kind of strength of the gravitational field they're in, which is a bit of a loose concept uh, with this framework, planets orbiting the sun 
can be can be assumed to be test particles to a high degree of accuracy. So we're just saying relatively small particles or light follow these straight lines in space time. And the second is how does the the curvature of space time actually relate to the mass that's around there. And Einstein came up with the equation uh, just GAB equals 8 pi capital G. This is uh, the G from, from Newton's constant G over C to the fourth times TAB. Now, this is called the Einstein tensor. These ABs down here tell us what part of the tensor we're looking at. You can th kind of think of it as a matrix. So it doesn't have one value, it has, it has uh, multiple values. And this tensor depends only on the metric and the curvature of the space-time that, that we're dealing with. So this is a purely geometric quantity. There's nothing else that, that is involved in this side of the equation. Uh, these are all constants, so, so we don't really need to worry about that, but we do notice that uh, Newton's gravitational constant is in there, which is kind of interesting. And this term is called the stress-energy tensor, and it depends on the energy and momentum and different stresses, stresses like uh, pressure or shear forces or things like that, the, and the energy and momentum density of objects in there. So if I put some mass in here by E equals MC squared, that means I have some energy in here and it takes up a certain amount of space, so I have an associated energy density. And what this equation says is that if I have energy or, or if I have masses that are moving and it gives me some momentum, uh, if there's particles with momentum in that space, then the mass and energy in the space will curve the space time around it. And the the physicist, the well-known physicist John Wheeler came up with a very good good kind of a saying about general relativity. And he said that matter tells space how to curve and space tells matter how to move because these geodesics the, the shortest lines in that space-time are going to depend on, on what the metric is and what the curvature is and the geometry of that space. So the geometry, so this part is geometry. The geometry will tell light and the particles that are moving around in it how to move but the but different masses can also curve space-time and this equation is actually very complicated to solve and and that's one of the main difficulties with general relativity is just trying to find solutions to this there are very few exact solutions uh, to these equations so this very much changes our perception of how gravity works gravity in this framework is not a pulling force so let me write that down just to just to be clear. So in this framework, gravity does not pull, but instead it changes the geometry of space around it such that it will affect how light and different particles move through that space. So gravity doesn't pull it changes geometry, which changes how, how particles move, uh, which, is a, which is a very different viewpoint. But right now, uh, at, the, at the point we're at now, this is still just a theory. So in order for us to determine whether or not this is a good theory, and this is very important, this is critical for, for any physical theory, 
the only way that we can determine whether or not this is a good theory is to check it observationally. And we do that by saying, all right, I'm going to try to say, how does this match up with an experiment that I could do to see what the effects of this are? What are all of the consequences to this kind of, uh, to this kind of thinking? And does it offer a way to test whether those consequences are actually seen in the real world? And we're going to look at that in the next video to see how verifications of general relativity were made. What, if, what uh, physical effects come out of this theory and how have we actually seen them in real life. So we'll see that in the next video.